Bonsoir. How are you, dear friends? We are building the most inspiring and phenomenal communities of wine lovers. As we all know, wine is the catalyst of the greatest discussion. We'll be talking wine, but of course food, and everything that touches all our nation and senses. Bonjour, bonsoir. Welcome to JCB Live. I'm so excited today for this happy hour. Very unusual happy hour. Very French in a way, because we have coffee at five o'clock in France as well. And then we move into wine. And then we move into a cocktail. What's more natural? Today, for that celebration, we've invited one of the most amazing experts on coffee. But besides coffee, his experience is incredible in the world of food. Obviously, a graduate from the famous Cornell University. Then he went into the restaurant, the sommelier world, the food world, then joined the wine world. So he knows everything about wine. Napa, Sonoma, Burgundy, Italy, well, the entire world. But he drinks a lot of spirits. This is why you see a little bit of spirits today. So I'm very pleased to introduce you a great friend. His name is Derek Bromley just like the town on the other side of the channel. And he created an amazing brand as well of coffee of his own, OHM. We partnered as well on him, having made all the great coffees at the Oakville Grocery and First Growth. So not only we love him, we do some great things together. He's a great inspiration, a fabulous talent. And for all of you who love wine, he brings wine and coffee together. So as the tradition wants, I'm going to have him come thanks to the sound of bubbles because he's a great musician and he comes when there's great sound. So you could see the power I'm displaying in his direction. He's going to actually catch the cork. Yes, baby. He got it. <laughs> hey, Derek, you're going to show the proof. Right here. Good to see <laughs> you. Great to see you, JC. Well, welcome. Glad to, to be here. Cheers. The world of JCB. I love uh, the mix here. A little bit of coffee, a little bit of wine, a little bit of spirits. This is, is there my, kind of, my kind of day. So we have been enjoying a liquid diet all day, and we said let's continue, invite a few friends, and really enjoy what wine and coffee have in common. So why coffee, Derek? Coffee, geez, why coffee? Well, I, I remember you need to taste because yes, if not, so it's tell me first, what how many years of, of bad experience could it be? <laughs> but certainly bad luck. <laughs> Number 21 we're drinking? Number 21. This is our Burgundy Chardonnay Pinot Noir blend that we love so much. And we open the show always with this because this is how life should be always, a bottle of bubbles. Lovely. So Cremant de Bourgogne as well? Cremant de Bourgogne. Now, the 69 is a Blanc de Noir. This has got a little bit of That's Chardonnay it. to lift it a bit. You see, he started his life with LVMH at Chandon. So he has a lot of bubble questions. You want to know the dosage? Nine grams. We keep, side, it, not bad. we keep it quite dry. So Derek, um, how has it been for you, an entrepreneur in wine, a great musician who decides to start his coffee, and why? <laughs> well, um, I'm going to talk while I start brewing here as well. But the interesting thing for me, I, I spent my whole career in beverage, food and beverage, but really fine beverage. And I was plugging along just fine in the wine business, uh, yes. selling $70, $100 bottles of wine over at Linmar Estate uh, around the time of 2004. And that was the first time I walked down a back alley in Hayes Valley, San Francisco, and I saw this line of people stretched down the alley. I'm thinking, what is that? Yes. So I walk over and there's this smell of coffee coming out of the, the garage door that was lifted up. It was Blue Bottle's first little kiosk there in Hayes Valley. And so I ordered a cappuccino. That had been my drink of choice. And uh, I remember taking my first sip and it was like the lights suddenly yeah. turned on. It was so like, it was early on for California because 2004 yeah. was really the, 
the stuttering beginning of coffee. Right at the beginning, yes. Yeah. And that was the first time I was selling $700 bottles of Pinot Noir. That was the first time I made a connection between coffee and wine where everything I'd been drinking had been the equivalent of California AVA. And all of a sudden I tasted a single vineyard and I saw what this, this wow. wonderful beverage could be. Um, so that started me down a long rabbit hole. And here well, I Well, it's an amazing later. rabbit hole because um, before we taste, of course, and we're going to make all of you jealous because we're going to be tasting and having you really feel the energy of each of those different blends. Uh, how do you compare coffee and wine and what brings them together? Well, the interesting thing about coffee, as I started to go down this rabbit hole, I started to teach myself a little bit about espresso, a little bit about origins, ultimately a little bit about roasting. Yes. Uh, one of the first things I learned is that coffee, as, as a roasted bean, has something like four times the flavor and aroma compounds relative to wine. Four uh, times. So think about how we've spent our lives training our palates to yes. taste the nuances of wine. You also have the perfume line, so you understand that there's much more than sure. what you might get in a glass of wine. The thing with coffee that's different and that's always a challenge is that so many of those flavor compounds are so volatile. They will mm -hmm. oxidize at a moment's notice. There's so much coffee in the U.S. that is just bad. Yeah. Um, Europe does a little bit better. Asia does extraordinarily well. Australia, oh, really? you can go into the Australian airport and get a decent cup of coffee just huh. at the, the airport kiosk. But for the most part, what we get of coffee here in the U.S. is something much less than what it should and ought to be. Um, so that's where the seed started for me, to really start mm -hmm. to, to bring... So you thought, I can make a difference. And I think it's yes. important for everybody to hear because you're a true entrepreneur. You know, starting the wine world and food and started your own business. Well, look at us. We're, we're in the heart of Napa Valley. We're in a global destination for food and wine. People come from everywhere to experience what Napa Valley offers for food and wine. And for the most part, we deliver until after dessert and that cup of coffee is served. And for the most part, it doesn't quite That's add right. up. Till you came up. in. That's now right. that you've arrived, you know, it's a very different experience. So I'm trying to change that one cup at a time. Yes. And, and now when you, when you bring the parallel, so you said four times, um, obviously more expression and so forth. Tell us uh, as well a little bit about how you're thinking of coffee within the different stratification of coffee. Uh, so relative to wine, you're saying? Yes. Um, well, yeah, so that, that was actually one of my first, as I'm thinking about the brand that I wanted to launch, I, I had this whole career moment where I was thinking, do I want to continue in the world of wine marketing? Do I want to look to become a general manager? Do I want to start my own winery? Yes. Um, as you well know, there's an awful lot of capital tied up for yeah. five, ten or more years before you even can sell your first bottle of wine. Um, what I realized with coffee is there's so many similarities, one of which is that your basic overwhelmed consumer. Mm. You know, think about walking down the aisle of Safeway and yes. how many labels of wine are, are facing the average consumer. And what are they, how are they actually deciding what's good and what's not good? How do you choose between 50 different Chardonnays, 100 different Chardonnays? This is a daunting and yes. intimidating experience. So there may, be a, there may be a score on the shelf talker, there may be a pretty label with a little critter or something on it. Yes. Um, but it's really hard to, to find um, what you like and then be able to get that repeatedly, even more so in the world of coffee. Yeah. Um, especially as you get up to the high end, much of coffee today, it's, there's a lot of single origins and there are a lot of um, this beautiful little lot of coffee came in and it was maybe 50 or 100 bags that came into the U.S. for the entire crop year. And so I might try that coffee, love it, and go back to buy it again, and it's gone. Yes. And coffee, actually, there's a lot more variability, vintage to vintage, year to year. More so, than wine. More so than wine. I see. Um, so oftentimes a coffee plant that puts out a great crop one year has an off year the next year. So it's, it's not And they don't vintage consistent. it, so you never know. Right. right. Ha, ha, ha. You just know if it's fresh crop or not fresh Well, crop. but that's a big deal. Um, you, you're opening our eyes to, to something we never think about. In the bottle of wine, we think vintage. Uh, not in sparkling wine as much, but we know it's a blend of the best, typically. Yes. Whereas wine, we very vintage focus. So with coffee, where do you source all your coffees? From all over the world, but it's funny you mentioned champagne. So I take a page out of both champagne, and for a while there I managed the luxury portfolio for Penfolds. Yes. Uh, when I was back in my treasury wine estates days, and the idea of forming an, an amazing blend and working with the best sources in the world, but creating a blend that is consistent to house style year in and year out was something that really appealed to me. 
Very important consistency. For that, yes, and I don't want my customers to, to fall in love with that little beautiful single finca um, Guatemala that I brought in and then have them not be able to get it again. That's right. So my whole approach was to use guitar amplifiers because I'm a musician and I love guitar amplifiers and love thinking about them all day long. And he's a great one. What's the name of the band? <laughs> Mama Said. Is Mama Said, I love it. We're actually doing our first um, COVID era um, concert a week from Saturday. On virtually? Uh, virtually, yes. So it'll be a Love live it. stream uh, for Connolly Ranch. So maybe what we'll do, dear friends, is we'll post it so you could all virtually be part of it. That's right. I uh, can tell you I will be part of it because I love his style. It's easy. It's a $25 ticket per household, and then there'll be a, um, a band that will open for us, Sal Belly Trio, and then Mama said will be the headliner, and it Fantastic. raises money for a great cause for Connolly Ranch. Oh, good. Farm-based sure. education right here in Napa Valley. We love it. So, um, yeah, so going back to that idea of blends being at the core of what I do, I, went, I roughly modeled each of my blends on different guitar amplifiers. And we did a very similar thing for you with the Oakville Roastery label where we modeled it on different wines. Um, so for me, the full stack blend is the Marshall full stack that Jimi Hendrix played or Led Zeppelin or, or Black Sabbath or any number of these so cool. hard rockers of the early days. Yeah. <laughs> Um, when you tasted that, we, you and I talked through it a lot and, you know, making those wine equivalents as well. The full stack slash um, Cabernet blend, so very similar is your Cabernet blend. We're going to try that here today right before we try a couple of Cabernets. So we're going to have a lot of fun because we're going to taste. And not to interrupt you, but explain to everyone what you're doing yeah. and how delicate you are in the making because we take coffee for granted. We sometimes just push on a button and we expect we're gonna get something great. We sometimes buy something in a little pouch in those long tubes or vertical tubes. We put in the machine with regular water and we think it's gonna be great. So there's a whole art to it. So today we will discover the art of coffee making. Very much so. So right now I'm making what's called a Chemex. Uh, this was one of the great, this was one of the early craft coffee makers before there was this craft movement of coffee. Uh, I think this design originates back to the early 70s, I want to say, sometime in that era. It's actually, the design is in the Museum of Modern Art. It's got this beautiful yeah. shape to it, um, but it actually makes a, a wonderful cup of coffee. The Chemex folks will tell you that the filter itself um, is engineered to remove a lot of the bitter um, compounds and, really? and various oils that get in the way of a great cup of and coffee. And the filter is important, but as you look at the shape, it looks like a decanter of wine. Yes. You know, we're basically, it spooses that lower part where it expands and the aroma remains through the serving of it. So tight. Very much. Neck, right? So I'm going to do my best to, to make a reasonable Chemex in the midst of talking, which is often hard because a funny, dif a funny difference with coffee relative to wine, uh, we were talking about this beforehand, that the gear that goes into making a great bottle of wine is all in the winery. Once yes. that cork goes in, you just need a corkscrew and a decent piece of stemware and generally you're going to be okay. With coffee, so much of the actual difference between a great cup and an okay cup and a terrible cup happens right here at this last moment That's of right. preparation. Uh, um, so and, and it's sometimes a step we undermine. We're rushing in the kitchen, we have guests, we go too fast, we don't prepare. That's right. Or in the morning, we rush out and we forget that coffee is often one of the most first ingredients we have early in the morning. That's right. As we get going, and, and often the one we have after lunch. If you have lunch, finishing with a great coffee, isn't it wonderful? It's uh, part of my morning meditation. First thing yeah. I go downstairs is, is pull a shot of espresso, make a cappuccino. So we assume your room is upstairs then. That's right. You're closer to heaven, that's why. That's right. <laughs> and I sleep in the cellar a lot because in those days of COVID, my wife kicked me down instead of <laughs> keeps me up. <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> More often than we think. <laughs> well, luckily for us, we have the wine cellar, so I'm not too bad. <laughs> That's right. So we're talking about blends. And yes. the idea of, of blends, to me, I, I don't want to have, I don't want to hinge on a single origin per se. Yes. But this first coffee we're going to taste is a, what's classically called a mocha java. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people hear that term, they think it uh, must be, have some chocolate component to it. Yes. Where does the mocha come from? 
Uh, it actually has nothing at all to do with chocolate. Mocha was the first trading port for coffee that's in the it. world. That's right. Um, just across the, the bay there from Ethiopia, Ethiopia. the birthplace of coffee. Mm -hmm. um, typically, a mocha java is a blend of a mocha component, which would be grown somewhere around the port of mocha. Typically means Ethiopia, because there's not a lot of coffee coming out of Yemen right now. And the java component would be Sumatra, classically. Um, I took a little bit of a different twist on that. My yes. Sumatra component is split between Sumatra and another region called Papua New Guinea. Ooh, very uh, nice, too. It's right next door, but has a beautiful mid-body palette to it. Um, it really brings the whole thing together. The Ethiopian So we're really talking a beautiful part of Africa. That's right. And this is very important because as in wine we travel, the beauty of coffee is we travel equally. That's right. And maybe actually more because most of the continents, actually, the wine we don't visit with wine as much we do for coffee. You know, you're talking Sumatra, you could talk Bali, you could talk... That's right. You know, Indonesia, you could talk all those great islands that we adore. Central, South America, Hawaii, Jamaica, even. Hawaii, yeah. Uh, but some amazing coffees and... So you like as... to think of the source, though. You think of terroir as well. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was actually one of the slightly different takes I had on coffee coming out of wine was the importance of terroir. Coffee is in the midst of this evolution right now where there was there were these waves of coffee. They call them the first wave, Folgers, yeah. Maxwell House, you know, the yeah. mass commodities. Folgers and all those. Second wave was Starbucks and Pete's. Yeah. So that was the upscaling of coffee. They made it okay to spend four or five dollars on a cup of coffee, which mm -hmm. was I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Starbucks and Pete's. Yes. But then you had the third wave, which was the folks like Blue Bottle and Ritual and Equator. They were the folks that sort of said, it's not about that dark roast, heavy handed approach that the second waivers were using. It's all about terroir. Mm -hmm. um, what I would have picked a little bit of a qualm with is I feel that those folks tend to under roast just a little bit. They tend to be making more the Gruner Veltliner and the Riesling style. Yes. What the Psalms love to drink, what the winemakers love to drink, but not so much what the broader um, population wants to drink. Mm -hmm. Their palate's not trained enough yet. I love third wave coffee, I'll drink it all day long, but some folk, I get a lot of folks that say, you know, I tried this or that third wave coffee, it's too lemony, it's too sour, I see. It's too, there's not enough. Which, which we get, as you morning. said, in the wine world. Now, tell us a little bit about roasting, because, you know, the way we met Derek, besides being friends, is we wanted to have amazing roasting, and that's the key. You know, the origin is one thing, the blend is another, but then if you miss your roasting, you're dead. Definitely. It's like the aging of a wine, you know. And um, I was very impressed with the very delicate approach of, of Derek and his understanding of temperature and length and how you basically roast the beans. So would you be so kind to touch on that? Sure. I'll do that while we uh, move into our... So you can see we're very here. civilized. It's not a mug. I don't like mug too much. <laughs> we are at home here because we spent a lot of time here and this is a Bernardo historical collection coffee cup. So why coffee? It's smaller, it's vertical. So we channel the aromatic expression. You take it with your index, very high cup, so you could hide, obviously, sugar if you wish. It's typically not proper to dilute your coffee with anything. Sure. So in the old days, if you polluted with vanilla or milk or cream or sugar, the coffee you were served, you would offend. It's like adding something to the wine you serve in the glass. Are you crazy? So this is why that cup is shaped, and, and I love it because I'm having, obviously, the Egyptian influence on this one, from the swans to the snakes, all hand-painted, and you have. I've gone with the outdoor thematic here. My, uh, cheers. Mother Nature. My retail version of the coffee business is actually an upscale coffee truck, espresso truck, which you've sampled the wares out of. Love it. So the idea of the outdoors and the Napa Valley summertime, this, this one appealed to me. Now the proper drinking, this is a pinky out? Yes, pinky, pinky out. Pinky out. Okay. Well, as we are with the king of coffee, uh, you know, king and queen, you have the pinky out. If not, you're not accepted at Buckingham Palace anymore. <laughs> it used to be, of course, Versailles, but you know our king, we're still enjoying his beautiful head in the Museum of the Louvre at this stage. So, <laughs> But what I love here, wow, describe us from aromatics to palate, because yeah. you're the expert. So this is, uh, like I said, our Cabernet roast. Um, the blend here is about 60% of an Ethiopia natural process. For me, the main component I'm looking for out of that is fresh blueberries. 
picked from the field. Uh, the better batches, the better roasts. There's a little bit of a hint of Meyer lemon, a brioche that's happening as well. Um, there's this just bright, beautiful thing, blueberry, blackberry fruit, like a great Napa Valley Cabernet. There's a lushness to it, yep. there's a fruitiness. Um, and I love that fruitiness. I feel it, not only on the nose, but even more in the palate. Yes. The challenge with it is that can get away from you a little bit, especially in a brewed coffee. So the Sumatra component, the Java component, brings a little bit of spice, a little bit of woodsiness. Yes. The Papua New Guinea in particular for me really ties, brings that mid palate together and the texture and allows the two to, to live in harmony with each other. Um, I initially started, I just had the Ethiopia and the Sumatra and there was always a little bit of tension going on yes. with the blend. And as soon as I got the Papua New Guinea in there, it really brought it together and made it harmonious. And that's obviously this one, mm -hmm. the Cabernet Roast, as we call it at the Oakville Grocery. You see uh, Derek very kindly uh, roasted it on June 29th, so we put that on the package because how much time do we want between the time we roast to the time we consume? Um, so typically, you have actually two layers. One is the green beans. So yep. green beans are a crop just like wine. A lot of people don't think about that at all, but ideally you want to be roasting your beans within nine months to a year of arrival in the At US. the most, right? Yep. Um, but ideally for roasting, so right off roast, the beans will exhale CO2 for a couple of days. They, they need to situate and figure themselves out. So yes. you can do brewed coffee 24 hours after roast. Particularly for espresso, though, it's better to wait three or four or five days That's uh, right. before you start pulling shots with it. Best window is going to be within a couple of weeks, uh, but certainly over the course of four weeks, you'll see a, you'll see a big evolution. Um, two weeks is going to be the ideal window. You know, I just, I'm pulling my beans off the shelf after about four weeks. Okay. I, I just don't, no matter what, I gas the bags. And I what do you everything. do with them? Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that online. You, you use them in gardening? Or... <laughs> That's right. They because, make great you know, compost. A composting is fantastic, so if you don't use your beans, or even when you make espresso, you end up with that powder, which yes. is basically the powder my grandmother was actually on the French press or in the espresso, having me mix it with compost. Oh, yes. And I That's loved great. it because for flat plants and earth, it's fantastic. My tomatoes are looking great this year, thanks to the, uh, thanks to the, the grounds. Yes. Shall we try a Cabernet wine to compare the two? Absolutely, yes. Well, we've got to finish this little sip. Cheers. Because, you know, both of you, wine and coffee people, not finishing our cups or our chalice. It's at least seven years of bad luck, right? For sure. So then, what, as I serve you the family classic, and this is our North Coast Napa Valley Raymond Cabernet blend, and dear friends, I'm excited to show you this label because this is where we are. Right now, we are right having this view. We are on Wapo Hill in, um, in the estates, in the family estates, and we could see Mount St. Helena out there. And this is a curated collection, which is only a small lot exclusive made for us, by us, from Raymond by the fabulous Stephanie Putnam. So, it's um, a great blend because Derek mentioned three origins mm -hmm. on the coffee, and we have three origins from the North Coast. A little bit of Napa, a little bit of Sonoma, and a little bit of Sonoma Valley. So Alexander Valley, Sonoma Valley, and Napa blended together. And you've got a North Coast appellation on the label. Um, a lot of people think that that's not necessarily as good, that you've downgraded from Napa or Sonoma or whatever, but um, I've tasted a lot of blended wines like that, multi-appellation wines. I used to work for Penfolds, Grange, one yeah. of the great wines of the world, is That's a right. South Australia appellation because they are sourcing from amazing vineyards from all over the region. And that's what you do with your blend. I, I'm a big fan of Derek's blend because it's actually really the alchemy of a variety of vineyards, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, coffee trees that really are blended together. And I think the art often, that's what I say, in Burgundy, it's easier sometimes to make a Grand Cru, a Clos Vougeau, than it may be to make a Burgundy Pinot Noir. Mm. One is $30, the other is $300, and it's harder because you have to take components from all over, and it's the art of blending. Clos Vougeau, you just have to get out of the way, That's not it. mess it up, right? That's it. <laughs> so what shall we do now, do you think? Uh, well, we've got a second Cabernet. Do we want to compare and contrast the three of these? We, we and, could. And we could. we are going to finish with a coffee cocktail as well. I love it. So I have another question for you, Derek, on coffee itself. 
Um, advise people what they should invest in besides the coffee itself. What tools do they need to have at home to make sure that they guarantee an amazing coffee? Sure. Well, I think the, the key first operating component is budget. It depends what your budget is. Um, espresso is probably not something to delve into unless you've got a few thousand dollars to throw at the problem. <laughs> um, there's just there's so much that goes into getting water hot, holding it there, getting the pressure consistent all the way through a shot. Um, one of the things that I advocate spending money on first before anything else is a great grinder. Because um, with a really good quality grinder, you can make up for substandard coffee makers, and it also opens you up to things like Chemex or yes. French press. You can dial in exactly the right grind, which is going to get you the right extraction. Mm -hmm. Problem with grinders is a lot of the the whirly blade one is the most yes. common, the twenty dollar um, you know famous grinder that's in every grocery store or kitchen supply though. store. Problem with it is it it destroys the beans. It whacks them all up. You get big particles. You get small particles. And when you go to blend, you get a, a big variation. It's sort of like picking a vineyard block at average ripeness versus right. optimum ripeness. Very good, so, very good analogy. So your big chards get under extracted. You're not getting all the sweetness and goodness out of the big components. And then the small ones are getting over extracted. So you're pulling out bitter compounds and, and things that are just not nearly as pleasant. Uh -huh. So a great grinder is gonna get you a really consistent grind that allows, that sets you up for success across really any um, brew method. That's great advice, and obviously to get on your mailing list, OHM. Own, yep, owncoffee.com. Very important because you want to get freshness, consistency, and quality. Same with Oakville Roastery, so you're welcome to combine both, and then you get on onto the recurrency of receiving it fresh. That's right. And, and correctly done at the right time, which is so important. Yep, so we roast every Monday and then, and then we mail our subscription shipments out that night. So typically our subscribers, if they live in the Napa area, they're receiving the bins within 24 hours of roasting. Um, and on the East Coast, you're getting them within 72 hours. So roasting. as we talk about coffee, and we'll go back to what inspires you because you have so many passions, coffee, wine, music, food, a little bit of everything, I like to dabble. I love it, so you've talked about the, the top of the pyramid now, the new, where do you see the new trends going in America for coffee? Well, I think this, this broader trend, I call it the crafting of everything. Okay. You know, in wine, we've been doing this for years and years. For sure. Robert Mondavi was one of the great proselytizers right. of Napa wine, and, and you know, where wine has gone over that time is, is to the stratosphere. But you've seen spirits follow that. You know, the craft beer movement has been around for a few decades. But if you look around, there's there's craft olive oil and balsamic vinegar and honey and you name the category, yes. it's out there. Mustard. Yes, all of it. Frenchmen, you know. Walk into Oakville Grocery and it's you can shop the the, the world, the yes. craft of worlds. Yes, craft is just all around you. Um, I think that's happening more and more with coffee. There is just the bar for coffee in this country is at a level where there's just so much room for improvement. Yes. Um, for me, one of the greatest joys of what I do is when I see that light bulb go off for people. Like for me, that first sip of blue bottle coffee, got, that first cappuccino I had, mm -hmm. it was like going from dark to light. And you know, folks, um, when they have that experience, that's what drives wanting to get a better grinder, or getting a better coffee maker, whatever it is. Yes. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars up front. It's just you, you take that small step into the next phase of your journey. Um, it was a very similar thing for me as a sommelier. It was less about telling people what they should or should not drink and was more about meeting them where their palate was at the time. Well, talking about some then, three words for this wine. Um, I love, well, let's see, three words. There is, there's well, a poison berry. Be more. Yep. Ooh. There's definitely the, the, that berry thing in the red, yeah. blue. Spice. Yes. Maybe a touch of satin as mm -hmm. well. There's a real nice texture. I like texture. that satin words. And it's always what I personally look for in a Cabernet, that very phenomenal, you know, lacy finish, yeah. you know. I like also that the oak is not overdone on this at all. Is there, is there much new oak in it? Not too much. No, purposely, I, I believe it's around 15% new oak. Okay. We purposely put a lot of second year and third year, so it's not overly prominent and overly toasty. And the fruit is really prominent up front and lovely texture to go with it. So I'm gonna ask you to finish your glass, and I know we wanna do the espresso now. Yes. And I'm gonna serve you, we could have had multiple glasses, but I know 
the both of us can certainly finish a wine glass. <laughs> now we're going to move to Oakville, of course. Oakville Grocery, home, and yourself, a lover of Napa Valley and a resident mm. of Napa. This so, is something else entirely. Entirely. When did you start playing music, by the way? Well, I think I, think I first picked up a guitar around the age 14 or 15. Mm. Um, I, you know, I started on the air guitar. I you know, listened to my favorite bands yeah, as a sure. teenager. Um, eventually, those I started playing a real guitar and started getting a few notes sounding like what was on the records. So you learn on um, your own? Largely on my own, yes. That's I've taken amazing. a few lessons here and there. And he is so amazing, you can't even imagine. <laughs> Thank you, I've Jamie. seen him in action. <laughs> Mamasadband.com. Uh, there's some live videos and clips and whatnot. Uh, yeah. We actually just released our first two songs on Spotify and iTunes. Whenever we can gather again as, so to speak, parties, we'll have them either at Raymond Vineyards or Oakville Roastery. Because it would be great to enjoy coffee and wine and, and have you as a band. Bring them all together. That's yes. it. That's a beautiful thing. Well, I'm so excited. Now, Cheers. as you talk about, you know, coffee, as you talk about all that, within you, what... I've never asked you that question, but what inspires you the most? Because you're very driven, you're very focused, you're very disciplined, but you have a lot of passion. So what, you know, in the back of yourselves, you know? Well, I think there's a, there's a self-expression component. You know, but I, I grew up with a very creative, artistic mother. My mom really? actually is a professional musician. So music was always in the house. What instruments? Uh, she plays, she sings and plays the harp. Wow. Um, so, and she's a writer, she's been a creative all of her life. That's so great. So it, it was wonderful inspiration to watch her pursue her inner voice and, and develop her passions over the course you of see, her life. You see, to all the mothers watching, you know, you have a huge influence. You know my story, many of you, my mother as well. So it's great to see. So she was your inspiration. Absolutely, on the creative side. Love you, Mom. Uh, and my dad was a successful businessman. Actually launched the U.S. branch of a French lace company based in Calais. Uh, Noyon Yes, lace. So. I know the name, of course. <laughs> so, Very big brand. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So I got to watch my dad be an entrepreneur and start from the bootstraps. He, he had left the family lace company and started the American branch of the French lace company. Yes. And I watched him grow that from a small bootstrap operation into a pretty large successful operation before all of that manufacturing moves elsewhere. That's <laughs> amazing. Around the globe. For sure. But I always had this dichotomy of the entrepreneurship and the creative. And mm. had those have always been a creative pension for me. So I yeah. played guitar all through as I was developing my career. And I'd like to think to some degree I'm finding a balance now where, you know, my day job, I'm still thinking about my night job, yes. uh, give or take. Um, but also, you know, my wife is, is also a creative. She's a voice actor. Yes. And I, part of what... She has a gorgeous me, voice. She sure and does. I, how do you manage when she takes someone else's voice and you don't know who she is on the phone? <laughs> Sometimes I try not to think about it, but no. Because she, she could be multiple women in one. That's right. That's right. Now, she's, she's extraordinarily talented, and back to your question about what drives me is, um, for both of us, it's really important to show our children you know, yes. that we are pursuing our inner voices and that they can accomplish anything. And oh. so part of this is really about modeling for them that um, some, someone early in my career, actually at LVMH, told me, don't worry about the career advancement or the next career step. Worry about doing what you love. Yes. And when you're doing what you love, the success, the, the financial success, whatever else, that comes. It's because you're never going to have the time to put, the, you're never going to be able to put that kind of passion in um, unless you're doing something that you truly love. Well, that's a great advice for everyone. Is Absolutely. there another advice as we hear you want to give to everybody listening? Because... Now you're putting me on the spot. Well, drink well, more coffee. <laughs> for no, sure. for sure, but you're a great inspiration. And what I love with you is you convert your ideas into action whether it's music, whether it's business, whether it's coffee, whether it's all the things you've done throughout your life is, is you convert them. So any suggestion for everyone besides taking risk? Uh, I think also enjoying the ride. That's, that's a yeah. really important one. Um, you know, I find myself working long hours, you know, as an entrepreneur, working yes. long hours and it's, there's always something else to be done. Is it working even? That's a good question. Yeah. Sometimes yes, sometimes, oftentimes no. Yeah. Uh, but remembering that we're, it's not the end, because it's never going to be done. It's the actual journey and the life that you create around following That's your it. passions. 
that yeah, piece is, to I me is really agree. important. I fully agree, and I'll, as, as we, we see Derek uh, making the espresso, I'll tell you my version of working. Sounds good. So right. let's finalize we'll this that. lovely wine and let's go back to coffee because this was the Oakville. So what do you think of this wine? Lovely. Darker, a little more brooding and, and seductive. Richer for sure. Yes. I mean, the we have the density of Oak, Oakville, right? The, the oak is stronger, but you've got the fruit that can stand up to that. Yeah. There's a really nice harmony happening in there. And I think we should yeah, keep this wine as well for for the espresso because the yep. roasting here, meaning the barrel contribution is quite intense. Huh? That's right. It's still very present. Long Can, finish, young. This is 2015, but this has got years and years yeah, ahead. Yeah, years ahead, years ahead. So maybe you made the espresso. I'm gonna go pull a couple of shots of espresso. So we have, and I'll tell our friends about this little cup okay. while you do this. Perfect. So Derek brought his entire equipment because he told me, Jean-Charles, your machine is okay, but not as good as mine. So he's disappearing for one second and he'll be back. Dear friends, what is exciting today is we chose to show you porcelain of Limoges, of course. So this is really one of the most beautiful historical maker, manufacturer royal of France. You can hear him making the espresso. I cannot wait. And now we are going to enjoy the espresso in something very different. It's actually a major innovation from Baccarat. So this is the Darcourt model, which was actually modeled in the middle of the 19th century under Napoleon III. And this is that unbelievable shape that is normally a wine glass, a water glass, a presentation glass, or champagne glass. They decided to cut the stem, and we promote them at the JCB collection because we love them on a nice acrylic tray so it never melts or warm up or conducts temperature and you enjoy the espresso as you will see like this. This is the way I drink my espresso every morning. Wherever I am because I love this so much. If I travel I take it with me and if I'm in Burgundy I have the same set and here in Napa Valley. So I, I really believe I see a lot of us rushing with paper cups and all that around. I think it's important as well to set up the table. As you can see here, we at home, and I want to make sure that everybody loves the emotion of the touch, all the senses. So you can see this is one of my favorite cup. This could be a teacup or coffee cup. Typically it's known as a teacup because it's a little larger. And as you know, in France, when all those things are created, we like coffee tight, and we like tea in a larger uh, cup. And this is the Jeff Koons collection that is made by, again, our friends at Bernardo. You know, Bernardo is another family business. We're gonna have Michel Bernardo and Corinne Oates soon on the show, because we want you to discover how we make Porcelain and the history of porcelain, way back from China to having the kaolin being developed and, you know, uh, created in France in the town of Limoges in the southwest, and, you know, Meissen and all the beautiful makers of Europe. So it's really important to celebrate with beautiful things. So as many of you come to visit us at Raymond or JCB, you know, we love. Limoges, but we love crystal as well. And it's going to be very unusual to enjoy espresso in crystal. And finally, what I want to tell you is what is so cool with this wine? Only 200 cases made. This is the Oakville and the 2015 vintage. So if you like it or if you want it, jump on it because we don't make a lot. This is the one I actually save in the cellar because I love it specifically with the Oakville roast tree and the Cabernet roast blend we had, which is really, again, full-bodied and rich. We do the Syrah, which is seductive, the single origin that we talked about, and the elegant Pinot Noir. Ooh, la, la! Thank you so much. Now, we can do this, uh, we'll do this as a cocktail, but I thought it'd be worth showing the espresso as well. I love it. Um, here, 
one of the first things you notice is the crema. Yes. Oftentimes when you are, receive a shot of espresso, if there's a crema on it, it tends to be very white. It tends to be very, it diffuses very quickly. For sure. You can see here, we're almost looking at more of a caramel butterscotch sort of color to the, yes. to the crema that's on top. Um, this is called a double ristretto shot of espresso. So we've um, almost made a com more concentrated than a regular shot of espresso. There's one part of coffee to one and a half parts of water. So one part of coffee, one and a half part of water. So in my case, I'm using 20 grams, 21 grams of coffee. Yes. An average espresso shot when you go into a restaurant is going to be maybe 10 grams. Yes. So twice the coffee that goes into it. And then I'm only, I'm getting about 30 grams total of liquid coming out. So that one and a half times. Wow. Fantastic. Um, so you get a wonderful concentration here. And an incredible aroma. Yes. I it's wish delicious. you could through your little screen, all of you, why don't you describe you. this unbelievable nose we have? Mm. God, this is why coffee is so fascinating. And this is why we invite you to discover the whole varieties of all the coffees we make because it's exactly like wine. And as you said, maybe more complex. Absolutely. So, so here we're using uh, the Syrah blend. Um, so we've gone from that blueberry, blackberry fruit into the darker end of the spectrum. Still staying in fruit though, because a lot of dark roasted coffee, it goes into the tar and the char and the, yes. the too much, the fruit is gone, it's, it's all burnt off. For me, what I'm trying to find here is that expression of maximum natural sweetness in the coffee bean. Yes. Um, this should taste, a great shot of espresso should taste sweet on the palate. Mm. You shouldn't need sugar, it shouldn't be That's bitter, right. it shouldn't be astringent. There's some, your average coffee bean's got 10, 12% starches that can be converted into various forms of sugar. And I like it in Italy, they serve it with a little glass of water. Why is that? Refresh the palate, yeah. you know, allows you to go back for the next sip. I mean, this is really concentrated, so it, it lingers. Um, but I just love it, themselves. and it has that powerful mouthfeel, envelops your palate, and has a tremendous length. Yeah. I'm a big fan of it. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, dried figs is a, is a component that I'm often finding in that, toasted marshmallow. I like the campfire notes, but without the smoke of the campfire. You know, that, Ooh, I like that. that. Still, we're, we're staying in origin here. We're really trying to get the, um, the idea of, of bringing out the best in the bean, even if it's a little bit of a darker profile than, than normal. Well, you've really succeeded. Shall we uh, create uh, the cocktail right here? Yeah. Do you want to come closer so everyone so, can see you? Yeah. Let me Obviously. get the ice in here first. So you can see, Derek is a man of old talent, what we call in the modern world and the historical world, a renaissance man. <laughs> a man who knows how to use his brain and his hands for multiple purpose. So, Derek, uh, how are you an inspiration to your kids? You've mentioned that, and you got me thinking when you said that. An inspiration <laughs> for others and an inspiration for your children. Well, I mean, First and foremost, it's as much as I can in a busy entrepreneurial lifestyle is to be present and to be there, to, you know, for those moments, for getting student of the month at school or, or whatever it is, the big, the big moments and the small moments. Um, letting them know they're, they're loved unconditionally, right? That's the, the simple things we do as parents. That, That's true. That validate. But it's not that are. obvious to do, you know? Yes, yes, for sure. And, you know, our kids are, uh, they're actually already pursuing some of their own dreams as well. My, my daughter was in a feature film last year. Uh, they're both working voice actors uh, following in their mother's footsteps. Um, so my daughter Lila played the voice of Harmony in wow. Toy Story 4. Um, this is fantastic. Yes. We loved it. Well, who hasn't seen Toy Story 4? You know, I love the movie, my daughters too, so we listen to your daughter. <laughs> That's great, yes. I love it. Um, but she's also an aspiring baker. So during COVID, one of her big um, extracurricular activities has been learning baking. So she's now making French macarons. She's making wow. pâte de choux. And, uh, well, when are they coming to the Ugo grocery? We may have to have her in there soon. Oh, we'd love it. <laughs> With a picture on the pack. So we seduced by her charm. That's right. So I'm making a version of a espresso martini here. It's very similar to a black Russian. Love it. Um, you know, your classic black Russian is two parts vodka to one part coffee liqueur. So I've got that going so far. But then we're going to add a little bit of a We're living a twist. the dream. You know, we had wines, we had coffee. Now we're having a cocktail, of course, dear friends, with the JCB vodka. And, you know, 
you, you really were so kind to really insist that we use our vodka. Absolutely. Not that we wouldn't, but you kindly suggested it because as Derek and I are lovers of what comes from other nature, this is actually wine. Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, we make wine and then we distill and then we filter, distill seven times. So it's very dense, it's very rich, it's very unctuous and it's very long finish. So I'm delighted that you wanted all of us to be within that world. Yes. We're using a gorgeous Saint Louis shaker that is of course available as well at the JCB Lounge. And why Saint Louis? You know, Saint Louis is the first crystal maker of France. 1698, 17th century. Baccarat came after in 1743. So this is really, really cool because they've created an amazing thick crystal, very powerful with a great, you know, um, obviously silver uh, finish. And uh, this is as well as beautiful as it will taste. So I've got a few different names in consideration for this cocktail. Aha. JC, maybe you can help, or maybe we'll put it out to the, to the crowd here and see I what the I think it's a great idea. Uh, Chat your suggestions, the name for this one. So the first is Legal Speedball, Ooh. because we've got the, obviously the alcohol and the caffeine working in tandem and or in tension with each other. That's a cool name. Um, second is Goes to Eleven. Uh, reference back for those Spinal Tap lovers out there. Yes. Uh, the idea of the, the, the amp that turns up to 11. That's it. And uh, after you have a few sips of this, the, the third one comes to mind, which is Hammer of the Gods. <laughs> <laughs> I like that too. So, so this is a, uh, that's an homage to Led Zeppelin. And, yes. Uh, one of your favorite, of course. One right? of my favorite inspirations, yes. That's actually uh, my Black Magic blend. That's um, it. That's what, what the name was inspired by, the amp that was used for Led Zeppelin 1. So I've, I've done the classic black Russian, I've added a little bit of a craft bitters, similar to Angostura, but it's got a little bit more um, um, spice to it, and I actually think like the way that it plays with the, with the Syrah blend. Yes. And then I'm finishing with the espresso going in. I didn't want to shake the espresso in with the cocktail because I'm afraid of bruising it, sort of like bru shaking gin. Um, I, I wanted it to just be able to go in. It still makes a cold drink if you've got the, the glass nice and cold and you've shaken it really well. And I'm delighted because I like it stir always better. If not, just add it as you just did. So yes. much better suggestion. And if you do it fresh, we've been talking here, but there is still a little crema that survives on the top. So um, if you're pulling a fresh shot, that's the best way to do it. Then you'll actually get some of that crema um, from a from well, classic espresso. This is our future passion glass. The only two Cheers. in the US right now, it's the prototype. It will be released next year. So passion glass. Oh, lovely. Mm. <laughs> what I like Donnell would be here, she would spank me, of course, <laughs> because she loves that noise when I do that, when she does her own cocktail on wine styles, but I'm, I love it. So describe it, please. What I like a lot about this cocktail, um, Ohm Amplified Beverages, the name came from, obviously, Ohm is guitar amplifiers yes. and, and all of that. But the idea of an amplified beverage is something that gets you amped up, it, it helps you live your best life, but does it without the, the use of excessive sugar, excessive things that cause inflammation. You know, this, there are a lot of coffee companies out there that are making coffee milkshakes. You know, they're yes. putting the pumps of caramel and this and that and the other thing in. This has got a little bit of sweetness from the coffee liqueur, yes. but it's really balanced. There's not that cloying finish of sweetness mm. that so many cocktails tend to have. There's a, there's a brightness, there's an acidity, there's the, um, the espresso is really just kind of waking everything up and, and uh, making me feel alive. I'm a I like big fan. <laughs> You've done an amazing job. And I love your cold brew, of course, and the wine oh, we do together with the Oakville uh, Rose Tree. That's right. Now, we have a few seconds left. We gotta go to your dreams. What is the dream of Derek Bromley now in 2020? Well, for 2020, and I'm glad you qualified. Well, 2020 and beyond. No, no, your dreams, or a dream you haven't yet achieved. For sure. I mean, there's the short-term dream of us all just getting back to a normal life and being able to, to really reopen this valley. So I'll toast again to that. Yes. See, that's absolutely. an excuse to have another sip. <laughs> Um, the next, the one that I've got that's the bigger picture, I mean, yes, I've got 
the musical dreams and, and the things that um, yeah. continuing to, to express, but I would love to see Napa Valley become known as a coffee destination, mm. as much as it is a wine and increasingly a beer destination. Um, there's right. no reason why this shouldn't be a gastronomic destination for food, for wine, for, for all things great that go into your body. I'm, I'm so delighted of your dream because we're fulfilling a part of it at the Oakville Grocery, Roastery, Brewery. That's right. Because we're trying to do all of the above <laughs> in a little place. <laughs> and you haven't hesitated. Your coffee program has grown leaps and bounds. Well, thanks to you. We've been working and together. I want to say to all of you coming to Napa Valley, obviously you need to discover home, which you can at all our destination and naturally uh, taste all the great coffees at Oakville Roastery, which have improved significantly thanks to everything you've done. Best coffee on Highway 29, I'd like the to The best think. coffee on Highway 29. <laughs> One last thing. Give us a secret you've never shared. Oh, man. We now want that little funny. spice. <laughs> Before we all go tonight and celebrate life, <laughs> drink coffee better than ever, wine and black Russians. Wine and black Russians. Um, it's a secret I've never shared. Well, one I rarely share is I actually can't drink a whole lot of coffee. Oh. <laughs> Did <laughs> I hear that? <laughs> so, you know, I've got gastric and gastrointestinal things. I can't eat, I can't drink lots of coffee. So what started me down this path was less but better. I drink two really great well, espresso drinks a day and that's about my limit. It's a great advice, you know, moderation. So, Derek, thank you so much for being with us tonight for our happy hour. Pleasure to be here. Well, we've traveled through the world of coffee, we've traveled through the world of wine, and obviously we've traveled through the world of one of the most magical cocktails. So, Derek, thank you. Inspirational, aspirational, a true entrepreneur, a man who loves to take risk, loves his family, loves his music, and loves to focus as well on quality with great dreams. Cheers, JC. Derek, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. See you soon. Cheers. <laughs>